Welcome, welcome. My name is Alexander Hamilton, and I am very happy to be here. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, where might uh, where might you be from? We're from New York State. Oh, fellow New Yorkers, welcome. It's my adopted home, but I consider myself a New Yorker true to heart. Uh, he is my son, and he homeschools, so we came here to learn about Alexander Hamilton, yourself, because he doesn't know much about Alexander Hamilton, so I was hoping you could explain some of your most important achievements. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, well, depending upon your age, you might actually deal with me personally on a daily basis, for I'm on the $10 bill. Uh, the main reason why I'm there is because I was your very first Secretary of the Treasury. But I am famous for many things, and I will paint the picture as to say that the America that you live in would not be the America if it was not for me. I also really idealized the America's story as I was born a poor bastard, meaning my mother and father were not married to each other, down in the Caribbean. But it is only through my own wit and wisdom that I was able to gain to the prominence of such an important position as being in charge of the money of the United States of America. But really, it all started with a hurricane down in the Caribbean. And that's where I wrote a letter to the local newspaper, and the brilliance of my words were noticed. And I realized one of the most important lessons in life is to find mentors. Find important people around you in your circle of trust and gain their wisdom and gain their trust. My very first mentor was Mr. Kruger with a trading firm that I worked with. After my father left and my mother passed away, I was left all alone in the world, and Mr. Kruger uh, took me in into the trading firm and gave me a job. And then it was he who bankrolled my funding to go to New York. As soon as I arrived into New York, I started in King's College, which is today referred to as Columbia University, and then as a young student, I realized that the winds of change were in the air. Revolution has, was no longer a foreign idea as many, great many efforts, starting all the way back from 1765, uh, were taking place. Uh, this was now in 1774, and we've already had the Boston Massacre. Um, and the ideas of self-government uh, were starting to erupt. Uh, without getting too philosophical, I'd like to go into that later for more of the adults, but what I did was to join a militia company called the Hearts of Oak, and we were made up of the students from King's College. Because we were college students, most of us came from money, though I, of course, had a very limited amount of uh, money given to me by Mr. Kruger, but we became the only uniformed militia from New York City. And it was there that one night we went on from our uh, local drinking establishment near the college. We went on down from City Hall to Battery, and we stole the British cannons, which were there for our security, supposedly, and we brought them on up. At this point, uh, war had already broken out uh, in, uh, up in Massachusetts, and so we were starting to uh, arm ourselves for our own defense. It was then I trained to be an artillery captain. Since I had the cannons, uh, all I needed to do was figure out the trigonometry of it all. Um, and as a military uh, artillery captain, uh, I was then noticed by my third mentor, George Washington, who took me under his wing. And then under his tutelage, uh, we eventually, as you know, won the war. Following the war, I went back to New York. I trained as a lawyer. And then as our first form of government, the Articles of Confederation, was being realized to be too weak to keep the newly established 13 colonies uh, to keep our freedom uh, established for us, 
we decided to form a more perfect union. And the Constitutional Convention eventually took part. And then I was instrumental in getting New York to ratify said Constitution by writing the great majority of the Federalist Papers. After our new Constitution was established, uh, then I was again tapped by George Washington, who was now elected president to be the first Secretary of the Treasury. My most important job as Secretary of the Treasury uh, was to create a unified currency for our country and to set our economic prosperity uh, underway. And I did so through a great many endeavors. But those endeavors have now realized themselves to be the American dollar being the world currency for the vast majority of trading goods uh, that have taken place. So these are some of my more uh, important accomplishments uh, but then, of course, I'm also known for some of the scandals that happened in my life. But eventually, my passing was one of a duel of honor with Aaron Burr, who was then the vice president serving under Thomas Jefferson. That is a very re quick recap of my life. <laughs> Hello and welcome. Hi, I'm Paige. Thanks for having me. My pleasure, Paige. Welcome. And where are you from? I live in Charleston, South Carolina. I'm from Atlanta. Oh, wonderful. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, any questions you, you might possibly have for me, I am very happy to answer. Uh, we have a young student who is homeschooling right now, uh, which is something that I'm very familiar with. Um, because my parents were not wed, uh, I was not allowed to go to the local school down in St. Croix. And so I was actually homeschooled with a Jewish family who also being Jewish were not afforded the opportunity to go to the local school as well. So I was homeschooled by them at my earliest endeavor. Uh, my mother, when she passed away, she left me the greatest of gifts, her small library of about 20 books. And it was then that I studied those books uh, to my own benefit. If I did not have those books, I do not think that I would be the man that stands before you, which means that you would not have the country that you currently live in. So homeschooling created the man who I am. Yes. Um, what were the majority of the books? Uh, the majority of the books had to do with history. Uh, there was a lot of books uh, from... Uh, Pliny, uh, Cicero, um, there were, I must say, uh, some other books that were a little bit more contemporary, but not famous, so you would not have heard about them, uh, but uh, slightly more than half uh, had to do with Greek and Roman history. Okay, thanks. My pleasure. Welcome. <laughs> Uh, if you have any questions at all, please just uh, let me know. Raise your hand, and I'm very happy to answer anything at all. Yes. Um, <laughs> did you have a lot of math education? How did you know about the monetary system? Absolutely. Uh, math is instrumental. Uh, when my mother was still alive, she had a small... Um, I don't want to say a small trading firm. Basically, we operated a very small store on the, um, uh, in the local market. And this was our opportunity to buy goods that were coming off of the ships uh, and then hold them for future value and then sell them. So at, a, at an age of eight years old, I started understanding the concept of buying something uh, and then selling it at a higher price. But it is after my mother passed, when I was working with the Beekman and Kruger trading firm, that I really started to understand world currencies. Because I was an apprentice to the firm, I and at one point, uh, both Mr. Beekman, who was away in New York, and Mr. Kruger fell sick for a whole summer, I was in charge of the firm. And this is where I got a very good idea about ledgers, which is something which is actually quite important to your time because I believe you're creating a new ledger system uh, based on cryptocurrencies. Uh, the ledger systems that we had uh, were also in multiple currencies. So I would have an actual book, a physical ledger, uh, which was the account books for the trading firm. Uh, 
when a captain came off the ship, uh, we would negotiate the sale of whatever items he had. For example, if he had uh, sheep, I would have to make sure that the sheep were of good quality, that they would continue to live, uh, and that uh, the agreed-upon price before we saw the sheep was still a fair price. And then I would have to renegotiate with these very strong ship captains. Now, the method of payment could be in many different currencies. Uh, one of the, of course, the British uh, pound sterling was a very popular currency, um, but we also had the Spanish dollar, the French guilder, uh, and so on. So the different currencies also had their own exchange rates. So I would have an actual table of exchange rates, and I would have to figure out uh, the different rates based on the exchange rate, and the exchange rates would be updated basically when ships came in from a major city, most often from London. I would get the updated uh, exchange rates and then have to go through uh, what the actual rate was. The important thing about the ledger was that when I wrote down exactly what the number was, the ship captain would also do that because we did not actually exchange money per se. That was quite rare because we're dealing in large sums of money and I was not, we didn't have our own bank here at the trading firm. So, and the ship captain did not need to have his own pile of gold or silver on board the ship. So we would negotiate the rates and then he would write it down into his book and then the ship would sail with that book on off to New York or to London. And if, for example, at London, the, sh the ship captain would take the book off, bring it into his firm, and then it would be updated into the account at his firm, um, and then and so on. If they went to New York, the same thing would happen. And so there was a level of credit that was established between all of the trading partners. This credit was established because of trust, because without trust, uh, well, you would trust people because of honor, their own personal honor. Because without honor, you cannot have any trust. And without trust, uh, there really is no value in money, especially today, where today we deal with a, our currency is a fiat currency, meaning it's not backed by any tangible item. Um, our currencies also could be in the form of just credit notes. For example, a tobacco note, uh, which is simply a promissory note that the value of a future barrel, for example, the size of this table, uh, the barrel of tobacco would be worth a certain amount of pound sterling, but the, the farmer can sell that, um, that value of the hogshead and basically saying, I owe you one hogshead. Uh, we dealt with sugarcane, and so the same premise would apply to us as well, where we're dealing in credit of the future value of the uh, container of sugarcane. If, for example, one of us would write a decimal point in the wrong place or add a zero. Uh, it would take months, if not years, for the ship to go all the way back up to London and to New York and make its way down to the Caribbean to realize there's a problem and then to basically make a couple of circuits in order to find out exactly where the problem is. So if that is the case, once there's a problem, then you no longer have the ability to spend that money because the money's in question. Uh, you don't know if it's really 100 or 1,000 or 10. And so you cannot spend that credit that you, uh, that you may or may not have. So it becomes an inefficiency to business. Business is not able to be conducted as efficiently as it should be. So you would only conduct business with people that were honorable. Because if you conducted business with people that were not honorable, it is only a matter of time before their dishonesty manifested itself in one manner or way, uh, one manner or, uh, or, or way. And so it was incredibly important to establish uh, a trust amongst your trading partners. And so this is where I got a very strong sense of personal honor, which of course led to my own downfall at the end where I was in a duel of honor. Uh, but this is also where I really gained a true insight into the values of money uh, and how money uh, can be um, and how money can be used and how credit can be used. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, you said that fiat 
currency or in other words um like dollars and coins aren't really backed by anything these days were they at one time backed by something tangible uh the coins themselves were the tangible item uh the silver coins were the silver uh and the coin was worth the exact amount of the silver and for example if the silver coin was worth $1 and you wanted to buy something for 50 cents, you could literally just cut the coin in half and give them half of a coin because the silver could always be melted down going to any silversmith. Um, this was another way for people to keep value as well, where they would go to a silversmith and have uh, candelabras or something maybe less fine, like knives, forks, and spoons made out of silver, and that was your own personal store of wealth. Um, when banks would offer uh, notes, uh, they would simply, those notes would be backed by a specific amount of hard currency, or I should say silver or gold. Uh, oh, but in reality, it could be anything. It could be backed by a container of sugar cane, or it could be backed by a container of tobacco, which was very popular in the 18th century. And so having an item uh, that you knew had value uh, enabled you to then write scripts of piece of paper based upon that value. And the value of the coin is really determined about the value of the metal, which in itself has its own use. So for example, the gold was highly prized because it is easily malleable and it does not tarnish. Uh, silver, on the other hand, tarnishes quickly, and so uh, silver is worth much less because it is less desirable. And so it's the national, uh, international desirability of these hard metals uh, that we decided to give value to. But you can just as easily give value to anything. Uh, the Indians, when I arrived into the New World, uh, used the value of uh, wampum, which is basically a purple, um, a purple shell uh, as value. Uh, down in South America, they often use cacao, chocolate beans, uh, as a means of currency. And a chocolate bean really had the same value as a gold or silver coin, not a one-to-one -one value, but it had the same value as in you can take that item and also use it for something else. And it was that ability to use that item for something else, which gave it a value. And the more that society realized that they wanted to use that item for something, uh, the greater the worth of that item. Does that completely uh, explain or? Yes, question. I think so. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, so that means if you cut a silver coin into a silver dollar into a hundred pieces, or you would get a hundred cents. And then if you cut it into 200 pieces, each would be half a cent. That is correct, but very hard to do. So normally we would only cut a silver dollar up into eights. And so it would be a pieces of eight. Uh, that is pretty much when you have the coin, it's of such a size that once you get smaller than that, then it's no longer recognizable. Uh, when you take a circle and you cut it in half, it's recognizable as a half. And the same thing if you cut it into a quarter, it's recognizable as a quarter. Uh, and if you do it one more as an eighth, it's still recognizable. But once you get smaller than that, then it would be done by weight. Uh, what, uh, what some people who were not so honorable, what they would do would be every time they get a silver coin was just to shave off a teeny bit of it to create a teeny bit of silver. And so they would always take a couple of cents off of their coin. And this is how sometimes you ended up with coins that were not completely round anymore, but a little bit irregular because of other people just shaving off some value. And they keep doing that and then they can you can just take the silver, bring it to a silver smith, have them melt it down into an ignit, and basically you would now have a uh, easily portable and exchangeable form of currency. 
Ugh. That's terrible. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. Uh, but I have learned from the nature of man, basically, if it is possible to do, if you have a large enough population, uh, it is being done somewhere. What, per what protects the money of today from keeping its value? Faith. That's really it. Faith. What did you say? Faith? Faith. Faith or trust. That is really it. It is the, it is the faith in uh, the ability of the institution that's backing the currency that they will keep its value. Uh, that's very interesting to what's going on in the United States right now, because my uh, my predecessors, uh, now at the Treasury and also now at the Federal Reserve, more importantly at the Federal Reserve, they are changing the value of money right now. I believe in about two weeks or three weeks, oh no, I'm sorry, about four weeks from now, they will raise the interest rates on the value of money. Uh, and this is basically the rate upon which uh, different banks will charge each other. Right now, that rate is basically zero. Um, but it, that is the historical low that it basically can go. They also control the value of money by controlling the supply. So there is a very simple premise in economics where when you have a supply and demand, if you were to graph them, when they equal, when supply equals demand, that is where your price comes to bear. If you have a high demand but very low supply, well, the demand would raise up the price. Conversely, if you have a great supply and limited demand, the price of the item would fall. And the same is true with money. And so one of the jobs of uh, the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve is to control the amount of money that's in supply. And they have done this in the last two years to an historically high level. Um, and they are soon going to be taking money out of supply. Uh, but they have not said when they are going to do that. So that is how they manipulate the actual value of the dollar and how it can go up and down. Uh, inflation is the future value of the dollar because it is the buying power. If this candelabra would sell for $100, but if there is inflation of 5%, then next year this candelabra would be worth $105 uh, just because the money, the money, uh, the dollars that exist in society, the value of it has gone down equal to the inflation. And so right now, as people are getting raises with their jobs, you might get a 10% raise, but if the value, uh, if inflation goes up by 10%, then really your money is just buying the same amount. You're able to buy the same amount of apples or other items as you would. So you're not technically getting more money, though it costs 110 versus 100. Hello, welcome. My name is Alexander Hamilton, and I'm happy to answer any questions on uh, American history, finance, law, the U.S. Constitution, um, early America, anything that you um, might consider. And I'm happy to talk at length on any subject at all.